this was the worst day of my life, was here, right here. And because of luck and because I had a dog with an incredible uncanny ability, because of those things is the reason Brady is standing there filming this at the moment. What happened here was an infantry patrol from my battalion was coming up this track and it was a bit narrower, a bit narrower, a bit narrower. And um, they had a contact with Viet Cong. And they both shot at each other at the same time and the Viet Cong were wounded and came shooting down this track to a, uh, to a, a, a point, you know, 100 metres past here. And the, the Australians stopped and they could see that there was blood everywhere so somebody was wounded. So the commander, the platoon commander of that platoon, which was Delta Company, 12 platoon, called the task force and said, I want you to send trackers in. We're going to follow them. I was back at Nui Dat. I had got back there after a really bad episode. I hadn't got out of my dirty clothes. Everything was lying on the bed at Nui Dat and this yell came down, trackers, you're out. I threw my equipment on, got my rifle and Les Lambert, he was, the, he was my friend and he was the guy that was actually going to protect me when we started tracking. He said, we've got to get going. We had to run up the road and get on the Land Rover. We were flown by helicopter to a place out there and the helicopter dropped us off and then we walked up to the platoon. And the platoon commander came out to me and he said, we've got a good track for you here. I'm gonna tell you when to start and we will follow you. And he took me to the spot where the contact was and there's blood on the ground, right? And I looked at it and I looked up and I realized I was gonna go down a trail, a track. When I looked at that, I felt that I was sucking old pennies in my mouth. I got this taste in my mouth and um, I think really that's what you call a taste of fear. It was like sucking on old pennies or coins. I could feel this taste going through my mouth. And I said, yeah, right, okay, right. And Les looked at me and he said, well, hook up. I put the harness on the dog. Les got in behind me, looking at the trees. Behind Les was a guy called uh, Shelbourne, he was the forward scout of that platoon. Behind him was the platoon commander, the lieutenant. Behind him was a radio operator. Behind him was about 20 other men. The other men got off under the bush on either side and spread out. And the platoon commander radioed, told his radio operator, Tell them trackers, go, I go. So I'm ready to go and I got Caesar up to it and I got my rifle ready and I patted him and I said, seek. The first thing the dog does when that happens is he puts, put, Caesar put his nose down and the first thing that he smells is the thing that he's going to follow. And that was blood, boots, the smell of the body of the people, and that locked in called a smell print, and he, was, he would not go off that. So I started tracking, we came down here, and we're done around about 100 metres, and we'd got to just back there, and the dog was going left and right, and I was following, I could still see the blood, and I was looking ahead, I was so, I was so um, scared about the fact that I was walking on a track because I could be seen and there were mines on it. And if somebody's down that end and they see us, they fire down the track, they're gonna have six people all at once. Right? We walked on, walked on. Caesar came up to a point, 10 to 20 feet behind you, on the end of the 20 foot lead. And he put his head down and up, and then he did something he had never done before. He walked back to me. And I looked at him, I thought, what is this dog doing? Seek, 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 don't stop now, seek. 
and he walked back to me and I said, seek. And he walked up again and looked at me and he pushed his body against my leg and he sat on my foot. What are you thinking? Is this it's crazy. This is crazy. I thought, you bastard, you've got to keep working. And he sat on my foot and would not move up, right? I was going to abuse him one more time when all of these trees here were hit by a camera flash. A white flash. And at that moment I saw that flash, I felt this massive impact in my back and I went deaf. My ears popped in. I lifted about three feet off the ground here. I went up and forward and my rifle went straight into the sand and I was on my face sucking dirt. And I couldn't hear everything. Everything was just singing, zing, 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 zing. And I felt this enormous pain. <clears throat> and I, I looked up <clears throat> and Caesar was in front of me looking straight into my eyes. Just looking straight into my eyes. And the expression was, I told you not to go on. I felt this wetness shooting down my legs and I thought, oh Jesus, I've been hit. And I've been hit between the legs. Shoved my hand straight down inside my pants to check everything and I realised that I'd actually pissed myself. At that, a moment later, I could feel bits of branch and leaf sort of coming down from everywhere here. And Liz, my protector, is lying over there. And I turned around and said, what? What's happened? What's happened? What's happened? What's happened? And the scout was yelling something to him. And Liz turned around and said, don't move her out. We're in a minefield. I was laying here and Caesar's looking at me and I was exposed again as usual. I grabbed the dog and I rolled over here, Brain. And I wrapped, my, I wrapped my legs around him and I pulled him in tight to try and get some sort of cover. And I said, what's it? Who's hit? Who's hit? Les turned around and yelled again and came back. He said, platoon commander's gone. Radio operator's gone. Others have gone. Don't move. The radio operator, by that time I could hear crackle, crackle, but I couldn't see... I couldn't see the platoon commander. I couldn't see the radio operator. But I could hear groans and a really bad sounds. And I heard the radio operator straight on the radio to the task force. And I just lay there and I could smell this stuff in the air, which was explosive. And I knew that that was the exact time that we were going to be attacked. That's what happens, you shock the people and then you attack them. I knew we were going to be attacked. We weren't, nobody fired at us, and I heard that the first choppers coming, two choppers coming, I could hear them, clack, clack, clack. Caesar sat up and his ears shot out. That means there's choppers coming. He always knew that. And the first one came in over there and lowered lowered on a, on, the, uh, on, a, on a cable winch. Stokes litters to put in the wounded men. And the first one that they put into the litter was the platoon commander, who had lost both of his legs just at the knee. Then they, they put in others who were wounded, and I didn't know who they were, because they were hit in the bush from the flying shrapnel. I, w I waited. And they, they, they started to winch him up and I said to Shelbourne, the scout, what's bloody happened? And Shelbourne looked at me and he looked at the dog. And he said, hang on, hang on, hang on, wait, wait. And this guy hit the ground behind me and it was a, an engineer. And he was standing where the explosion was and he came up to me and he said, didn't I see you yesterday? I said, yeah. He said, um, there's a mine behind us, just hang on a minute. And he and his mate just walked up to there and they got down on their hands and knees and they were pushing the dirt around. And he stood up again with a minesweeper and came back to me. And he said, where did your dog go? 
I said, oh, up to about there. He said, is that as far as he went? I said, yes. He said, mate, mate, there's a 250 pound unexploded bomb in the middle of the track and there's four M16 mines attached to it. Really lucky you didn't go any further. If you trot on an M that M16 would blow and blow the main charge. That would flatten the whole of this long green. And when I got back over to Shilbo, I said, who trod on the mine? Who trod on the mine? And they said, Lieutenant, whose name I will not mention, trod on the mine. So I got back, we went back, and there was the hole in the ground. And the engineer looked at me and looked at the hole in the ground. He said, what's happened? Your dog's walked over it. You've walked over it. Your cover man's walked over it. Shelbourne's walked over it. The platoon commander stepped on it. And it blew. Okay, so how come I didn't got holes all over me? So the engineer said, because when it was put in the ground, it was put in slightly sideways, or it had been in for a while and had subsided. So when it exploded, it jumped when he trod on it, it jumped and exploded in 360 degrees, the shrapnel went out. It took his legs. The shrapnel this way went up. The shrapnel that way went down there. So it went over the top of me. The light flash in the trees was the detonation. I was in a state of shock. I had no idea what happened. I had no idea what was going on. And the first thing that I felt after that was explained to me, was an incredible sense of guilt. What I've done is I've, lent, I've, I've took 30 men into a minefield. I didn't, of course. I was tracking an enemy, and the enemy ran straight down the track. Dog followed, Peter followed, those behind me followed. I missed it, and the guy four behind me took it. Caesar was tracking. He was following a scent in the air, and he was following stuff on the ground. That dog was not trained to detect mines, never had been. It wasn't a mine dog, it was a tracking dog. But something here, a concentration of smell combined with an explosive smell, combined with it, uh, the smell of Viet Cong, alerted him, and in the dog psyche, the dog's mind, never understand, he came back and said, don't go, don't go, don't go. But, we had already walked over one. And that was behind and it didn't hit us. But that one was waiting to go. Saved my life. I would say he was saved the whole lot. Because the explosive power of that bomb would have been devastating in conjunction with the, all the mines that would have gone off around it. The engineer told me um, it was an unexploded artillery or naval shell that had been rigged up by the Viet Cong to place into here. So if you trot an M16 out there, out there, out there, it was gonna set off that big bang. That, that M16 mine that was down there that hit the platoon commander was not associated with these down here. It had been placed earlier or had been placed immediately that, that we started tracking. They dug it into the ground straight away. Hard to know because you couldn't tell from all the damage and the rest of it. The platoon commander lost his legs and went back to Australia, of course, and four other men were badly wounded by shrapnel, including the radio operator that caught it down the side of his face. My mate Les was not hit. The scout was flat on the ground. He wasn't hit, but the damage was caused and the bits that went out through those trees and hit those other men. Later on in the day, walked down to the end of that track, got on the helicopters and flew out, went back, and I was filled with guilt filled with guilt. But the guys from the Delta Company said, mate, so good, terrific, well done, mate. But I was filled with guilt. Why were they saying well done? All these guys have been hurt. But that was their attitude. It wasn't my fault. But in my head, I felt that I'd brought them here. But they know that I, that I hadn't brought them here. And they knew that something worse could have happened. But what happened was bad enough. Uh, well, I, ne I never thought um, in a million years I'd bring my son back here to the place where I, it was my near-death experience, okay? Back there. 
That was my near-death experience. There were probably many others, but that was the one where I and four others and the ability of an uncanny dog took us to this point and saved our lives. That dog saved, saved us. I would have tracked on. I would have tracked on. So they didn't tread on these mines that the Viet Cong had stolen to use against us. They were an obscenity. We got, you know, all upset because they're using these mines and blowing us up. When actually we built them to blow them up. Your whole life here and on all the operations, your whole life was concentrated on 50 metres in front of you, any time. 